Okay, so hello everyone and welcome to BrainMap. It's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Professor Morgan Barnes. Uh, Professor Barnes received her BA from Harvard University and her PhD from the University of Cambridge. She remained in Cambridge for a postdoctoral work to undertake a Peter House Research Fellowship and joined the faculty at the University of Toronto in 2009. She was promoted to associate professor in 2014 and to full professor in 2019. She currently directs the Toronto Neuroimaging Facility and has been trained in animal neuroscience, human neurophysiology, fMRI and cognitive physiology, uh, psychology, sorry, and enjoys bringing these approaches together to study the neural underpinnings of memory. She has been honored with a number of domestic and international awards, including a Young Investigator Award from the Cognitive Neuroscience Society, an Early Investigator Award and Lifetime Fellowship from the Society of Experimental Psychologists, an Early Career Award from the Canadian Society for Brain Behavior and Cognitive Sciences, a Canada Research Chair in Cognitive Neuroscience, the James McDonald Foundation Scholar Award, an Early Research Award from the Province of Ontario, and a, a Connaught Innovation Award. Uh, I would like to remind the audience to please address any questions you have, even during the, uh, the talk, using the Q&A box. Professor Barnes, thank you very much for coming here today. The virtual stage is yours. Thank you so much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Can everyone hear me? Can you hear me all right? Yep. Okay, wonderful. Um, so <clears throat> I'll just get started. So like so many memory seminars, I am going to start um, by discussing HM, but I wanna to talk to you about HM, not because of what his case told us about memory in the brain, which was a lot, but rather I wanna start off by talking about HM because of what his case and its subsequent interpretation did not tell us. So in 1953, at the age of 27, HM underwent a radical bilateral medial temporal lobe resection to treat his intractable epilepsy. His surgery included not just his hippocampus, but also the surrounding medial temporal lobe structures, such as the perirhinal cortex and entorhinal cortex. I'm gonna be focusing on a lot today. So HM was left densely amnesic after this experimental surgery, unable to form new memories for facts and events. And this was a process that came to be termed in the field declarative memory. But what was so important for the science of memory is that at least on the face of it, HM's deficit seemed to be incredibly selective to declarative memory. Other cognitive functions like perception, working memory, implicit memory, and his general intellect all appeared to be intact. And this remarkable pattern of preserved and disrupted cognition led to one of the guiding principles in the cognitive neuroscience of memory. And that is that memory has a privileged status and is a distinct brain function that's separable from other cognitive abilities, like let's say perception. And this, was enshrined in the idea that medial temporal lobe structures constitute a dedicated memory system with no role in perception. And this view of a dedicated MTL memory system governed memory research for decades until some controversial work from the non-human primate literature started to emerge. So these reports suggested that one medial temporal lobe structure, the perirhinal cortex, was critical for the perception of complex objects in addition to its role in memory. So for example, monkeys with perirhinal lesions were impaired when they had to select the odd one out from an array of visually similar objects. However, when the discrimination could be solved using just a single feature, such as shape shown here, these same monkeys perform normally. Now these findings were a challenge to the notion that the medial temporal lobe exclusively supports declarative memory. And thinking more generally, these findings were also a challenge to the notion that cognition is highly modular with segregated systems for cognitive functions like perception and memory. But at this point, there was one huge problem. And that was that these findings had yet to be replicated in human amnesics who had medial temporal lobe damage. So way back when, um, at the start of my PhD in Cambridge, that's what we started, uh, that's what we set out to do. 
So we created a series of complex object perception tasks that were inspired by this non-human primate animal literature. And consistently, we found that amnesic patients with perirhinal damage were impaired when the objects they had to perceive to discriminate between were visually very similar. So here um, on this slide, I'm gonna really quickly go through what, was, what amounted to about a decade uh, of my life conducting these studies. So for example, <clears throat> when selecting uh, the odd one out, perirhinal damage, in, uh, so the odd one out would be this hat here or this hat here. So perirhinal damage impaired performance when the objects had a high degree of overlap. But when there was a low degree of overlap, so selecting this object here, the patients were intact. And likewise, when judging whether two simultaneously presented novel objects were the same or different, perirhinal damage impaired performance when there was a high degree of overlap, but not when there was a low degree of overlap between the objects. And I also just wanna quickly say that this isn't a matter of difficulty. <clears throat> the same patients performed normally on a series of additional control conditions that, that were matched in terms of difficulty, but could be solved on the basis of a single feature like their size. And in another series of studies, we found that perirhinal damage impaired object discrimination when a conjunction of features was required to identify the target object, but not when the targets could be identified on the basis of a single feature. And finally, we found that the perirhinal cortex was necessary for making normal figure ground judgments when the conjunction of features depicted a familiar object. So here, the conjunction of features depicts the silhouette of a woman. However, when these same features were scrambled, rendering the conjunction no longer informative, shown here, performance was normal. And in a series of convergent neuroimaging studies, we found more evidence that the medial temporal lobe was involved in perception. So more specifically, when the task required discriminating between visually similar complex objects, or when the task required processing conjunctions of object features, we found increased perirhinal activity for exactly the same conditions that were impaired by perirhinal damage. So put together, all this work that I showed you on those past slides um, showed that so-called you know, high-level brain regions like the perirhinal cortex are important for so-called low-level processes like perception. Now at the same time, other labs around the world have found evidence for the converse, that low-level brain regions like V1 are involved in high-level processes like memory. Now, I don't have time to go into this research in detail, but this particular study that I'm just showing you here as an example found that responses in V1 supported learning a complex visual spatial sequence and predicted long-term recognition memory after a long delay. And accumulating evidence from labs around the world has found evidence of long-term memory in early visual areas. So taking all of this, together, it seems that the medial temporal lobe is not just for memory, and memory is not just for the medial temporal lobe. So how are we to make sense of these findings? And what I will suggest is a representational hierarchical framework that has shaped much of my research program. So this view is based on a very simple idea that the well-established hierarchy in the ventral visual streams extends into the medial temporal lobe to include regions of the brain long thought to operate exclusively in the service of memory. So as you move forward in the ventral visual stream, the representations are in, of increasing complexity. Posterior regions at the back of the brain, posterior regions of the ventral visual stream at the back of the brain represent the basic features of objects like shapes, colors, lines. In more anterior regions, these low-level features are combined into simple feature conjunctions, such as basic shapes and color combinations. Now, finally, at the anterior most end of this pathway, which here we are positing to be the perirhinal cortex, these feature conjunctions come together to form a fully specified representation of the object. Now, this representation might be in terms of the visual assembly of the objects, uh, sorry, the visual assembly of the features, like I'm showing here, but it might also integrate semantic knowledge about the object itself. 
which is something that I'm gonna be addressing later on in this talk. So the critical aspect of this theory is that instead of thinking of the ventral visual stream as organized according to systems devoted to a given cognitive process, it focuses instead on the representational or the informational content of different brain regions. Now this view predicts perirhinal involvement based on the level of representation that is required. The informational, that is we're talking about the informational content that is needed to solve the task, not whether the task recruits the cognitive process of memory or the cognitive process of perception, but what information is needed to solve this task. So let me just walk this, walk you through this with a toy example. So let's say that you had to discriminate between this soup can and this loaf of bread. Now this discrimination is easily solved uh, by the single features that are represented posterior to the perirhinal cortex. So in this case, there is no feature level interference across the two objects. And so a perirhinal lesion would not impair performance on either a perceptual or on a mnemonic task. However, if the objects to be discriminated share a lot of features like this soup can and this flashlight, these low level features no longer provide the solution because they are highly overlapping. That is, there is now a lot of feature level interference. So in this case, an object level conjunction, uh, an object level conjunctive representation is required to resolve this feature level interference. And thus, a lesion to the perirhinal cortex would impair performance on either a perceptual or a mnemonic task. Now, this is a reconceptualization of how we think about amnesia. Rather than um, conceiving it in terms of damage to a system that's dedicated to the cognitive process of memory, we're thinking about amnesia as a representational deficit, an impoverished stimulus representation will impair both memory and perception. So <clears throat> I'm talking a lot about perception, but you might rightly ask, well, when we think about damage to the medial temporal lobe, we, the, the most salient deficit for these patients is in terms of a damage, is, is in terms of their memory. So why is medial temporal lobe damage so devastating to memory? And we think that it has to do with the role of medial temporal lobe representations in resolving interference. So everyday objects tend to share many low level features, which means that feature level interference almost always builds up across time. So for example, on a trip to the grocery store, we see lots of cylinders, <clears throat> silver circular tops and red labels. This feature level information accumulates in posterior regions of the ventral visual stream, creating interference that impacts performance when the perirhinal cortex is damaged. However, in the intact brain, the object level conjunctive representations can resolve this feature level interference by binding each, each feature to its respective unique object. So for example, the conjunctive representation contains the information that this particular red label um, and cylinder come together to form this Campbell's soup can, thus avoiding confusion with the visually similar red cylindrical can of beans. Now there are many different kinds of similarity that can lead to interference. And there are attributes other than visual information that can be used to resolve interference. So take this kind of silly headline for an example. So we immediately recognize this scenario is utterly ridiculous because despite the fact that they're very visually similar, a hairdryer and a speed gun are very different kinds of things. So given that there isn't always a one-to-one -one correspondence between the way two objects look, and what those two objects actually are, how are we able to make sense of all of the things that we see? So in this next part of my talk, I'm going to focus on how semantic meaning is extracted from and related to the perceptual attributes of objects. Now, many classic neuropsychological studies have provided compelling dissociations between visual perception and conceptual knowledge. 
So for example, patient DF, who has a lesion to the more posterior region, LOC, shows gross perceptual deficits. When she's asked to copy a picture of an apple, she produces something that doesn't look anything like an apple. But when that picture is taken away and she's asked to draw an apple from memory, she does a really good job. Now, in contrast, patients with semantic dementia, whose damage, at least initially, is focused on the anterior temporal lobes, do not show these gross perceptual deficits. They can copy a picture of a frog just fine. But when that picture is removed and they're asked to draw the frog from memory, they draw what I think is a very strange looking frog indeed. Now, these dissociations, however, do not preclude the possibility that visual and conceptual information might be integrated somewhere in the ventral visual stream. And in fact, it might be this convergence of visual and conceptual information that allows us to so easily discriminate between objects whose visual and conceptual features are orthogonal. So where in the brain might we find convergence of conceptual and visual information? And you're probably not surprised that we predicted the perirhinal cortex, which is densely connected with regions of the ventral visual stream known to be critical for object perception and also with the anterior temporal lobe known to be important for conceptual processing. And the perirhinal cortex has been linked to both of these processes. So as I just described, the perirhinal cortex is necessary for making visual uh, discriminations between visually similar novel objects. Now, in addition, a separate elegant stream of research has demonstrated that the perirhinal cortex is also very sensitive to conceptual similarities between familiar objects. So for example, the perirhinal cortex responded more similarly to a lime and an avocado than it did to a lime and a violin. However, though, you may have noticed that there's a bit of a problem here. Conceptually related objects tend to share visual features. So sensitivity to conceptual information might actually be driven by these visual factors. So to really address the question of integration of visual and conceptual information, we need to deconfound the conceptual and visual attributes by independently varying visual and conceptual overlap across objects. And that's exactly what my stellar former postdoc, Chris Martin did. So he painstakingly put together a word stimulus set based on chains of objects in which visual and conceptual uh, similarity were not linked. So for example, bullet and gun are conceptually but not visually similar. And conversely, gun and hairdryer are visually but not conceptually similar. So first, create, uh, Chris created a perceptual model that captured the visual similarities among the objects. So he had nearly 1,200 participants rate the visual similarity of pairs of the objects on a scale from one to five. So participants were asked, how visually similar are a bullet and a gun? How visually similar are a gun and a hairdryer? And so on and so forth. So all of these values created our visual model, which is a matrix depicting the visual similarity across all 40 of the objects in the stimulus set. So for example, here, gun and hair dryer have a high um, visual similarity percentile in this model, whereas gun and bullet do not. Chris then created a model that captured the conceptual similarities of these objects. So to do this, he had 1,600 participants provide semantic features for one object and only one object. So for example, <clears throat> 17 people told us that you could use a bullet to kill. No one said that a hair dryer could be used to kill, but 20 people said that it was used for hair. From all of these generated features, Chris calculated the cosine similarity across the objects. All of these values put together created our conceptual model, which is a matrix that's depicting the conceptual similarities across all 40 objects in the stimulus set. So here in this example, bullet and gun have a high cosine similarity of 0.42, whereas gun and hairdryer have a lower cosine similarity of 
So now it's important to note that here with this setup, the correlation between the visual and the conceptual models was not significant, thus removing the confound that stimuli that are conceptually similar also tend to be visually similar. And with this setup, we can now cleanly address the question of visual and conceptual information in the brain. So we took these objects to the scanner using still another group of participants. Chris scanned eight runs of a property verification task involving visual and conceptual properties. We created these two tasks because we really wanted our participants to have their attention biased to either the way the objects looked or to the object's abstract conceptual features. So for example, for the first half of the run, they made visual judgments for all of the objects, like, is this an angular object? And then for the second half of the run, they made conceptual judgments, like, is this object natural? And across all eight of the runs, the property to be verified was unique and the order was fully counterbalanced. So we assessed the similarity of brain activity between different objects during the visual and the conceptual tasks. So for example, we measured brain activity, uh, um, we measured brain activity patterns associated with these visual judgments for the word gun. And likewise, we measured these uh, patterns associated with visual judgments for the word bullet. And we then correlated these patterns of activity, asking how similar is the brain activity for bullet to the brain activity for gun? And we did this across every object in our stimulus set. And we did this for both the visual and the conceptual tasks. So this created two matrices reflecting the similarity of brain activity for different objects when they were thinking about either those objects' visual properties or those objects' conceptual properties. So to summarize, we've created four models in total. We have two brain models here that capture um, how similar the brain activity is for the different objects when they are be being considered in terms of either their visual or in terms of their conceptual properties. And we have two independent behavioral models that capture the actual visual and conceptual similarities of those objects. We then looked for correlations across these models, both within and across the visual and then conceptual domains. So with this analysis, we can ask whether the similarity in the brain data can be described in terms of how visually or conceptually similar the objects actually are. Now we are particularly interested in the cross domain correlations. So we'll ask, for example, whether the similarity of the brain data during the visual task can be captured by the conceptual similarities of those objects and vice versa. We'll ask whether the similarity in the brain data during the conceptual task can be captured by the visual similarities of these objects. If we find these correlations across domains, we have evidence that visual and conceptual information is integrated in terms of the information coding in the brain. So what I'm gonna, for the sake of time, um, what I'm gonna focus on here is an ROI analysis just of the perirhinal cortex. These ROI findings were supported by the whole brain analysis where the perirhinal cortex was the only region in the brain to show this pattern of results. And we also looked at several other focused ROIs, which I'd be happy to discuss later if you're interested. So what did we find? So on the visual task, we found that the similarity in the brain data could be described by how visually similar those objects were. And on the conceptual task, the patterns of brain activity could be described by how similar, how conceptually similar those objects were. But most interestingly, we observe this regardless of the task. So that is conceptual information about the objects was represented on the visual task and visual information was still represented on the conceptual task. So that is the perirhinal cortex um, coded, activity within the perirhinal cortex coded both visual and conceptual information regardless of the task. 
So this suggests that visual and conceptual information is integrated in perirenal coding, such that visual information comes along for the ride when completing a conceptual task and vice versa. Now, notably, we saw an interaction between models of visual and conceptual similarity and task, uh, task context. So although the perirenal cortex always coded both visual and conceptual information, the visual information was more strongly coded on the visual task and the conceptual information was more strongly coded on the conceptual task. So this is suggesting that attention transiently reshaped these multi the multidimensional similarity structure in perirenal cortex to meet task demands. So what does this mean? <clears throat> so despite the fact that we deconfounded visual and conceptual information, and despite the fact that our task biased processing towards either visual and, or conceptual features, perirhinal cortex nonetheless represented both perceptual, the both the visual and the conceptual features. So just stop and think about this for a moment. So while participants made judgments about the object's visual attributes, so for example, is a gun angular, is a bullet smooth, perirhinal coding captured the conceptual similarities of those objects. Conversely, while they made conceptual judgments about the objects, for example, is a hairdryer natural, is a gun pleasant, perirhinal coding captured the visual similarities of these objects. Now, the fact that a gun and a bullet are dangerous is not needed to assess whether they're angular. And likewise, you don't need to know that a gun and a hairdryer are visually similar to assess whether or not they are pleasant. But in terms of perirhinal coding, this information comes along for the ride. So why would the brain represent information in this way? In any given situation, only a subset of our full complement of knowledge is ever relevant to a task at hand. So for example, if I asked you to group these objects according to which you would want if you were hosting a dinner party versus hosting a jam session, I think we would all agree on this particular arrangement. And if I asked you to sort these objects based on their color, we would all come up with a sorting like this. And if I asked you to put these objects on a continuum regarding how you would feel about the objects, if a friend asked you to help move them out of her apartment, we would choose yet again different characteristics to emphasize and sort them very differently. So in order to use knowledge appropriately, the semantic system must retrieve diverse and often competing properties to complete different tasks. Now, of course, whether a property is interfering varies according to the particular context. So adaptive behavior requires that we flexibly resolve interference based on task demands. And I think that the multidimensional representational structure in perirhinal cortex is key to this interference resolution. So to get at these ideas, my then graduate students, uh, Rachel Newsom and Danielle Douglas designed a discrimination task that specifically pitted visual and conceptual information against each other. And we tested a patient, patient DA, who's bilateral damage, uh, who had bilateral damage to his perirhinal cortex. In this task, Participants had to choose whether the most visually similar or conceptually similar, they had to select the most visually or the most conceptually similar uh, object to a referent word. So on the visual task, the match <clears throat> was hairdryer, the match to gun was hairdryer, and on the conceptual task, the match was bullet. When there was minimal interference from the competing dimension, we found normal performance in, P in patient DA who had this, this uh, nearly complete bilateral perirhinal ablation. So this indicates that basic knowledge for both the visual and conceptual properties was intact following perirhinal damage. We then ran a version in which we increased the degree of interference by including the target from the competing dimension. So now on the visual task, the, the conceptual competitor bullet was also present. And on the conceptual task, the visual competitor hairdryer 
was now also present. So for this experiment, we had two control patients who had a lesion to the hippocampus bilaterally or to the VMPFC. And these two patients performed normally. We tested um, DA twice, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and on his first testing session, we found that he was impaired on both the visual and the conceptual task. And we replicated these findings in a second testing session. So thus, we observe susceptibility to visual and conceptual interference after perirhinal cortex damage. In order to better understand the nature of this deficit, we then looked at DA's errors. That is, when he is choosing the wrong answer, what is, what, what is the object that he's selecting? Controls and control patients evenly distributed their responses across the different possibilities. But patient DA consistently falls for the conceptual lore on the vis visual task, choosing bullet when he should have ch chosen hairdryer. And likewise, he fell for the visual lore on the conceptual task. So choosing hairdryer when he should have chosen bullet. So that is, he cannot resolve interference from the competing dimension. So how do we make sense of this? We think that the representational structure in perirhinal cortex is key to enabling this flexible resolution of interference from competing properties. So I'm gonna ask you to recall that interaction that I showed you <clears throat> in the fMRI study. So we found that perirhinal cortex codes both visual and conceptual information, but it can also dynamically reshape its multidimensional representational structure in a task relevant function. So thus on the visual task, visual attributes of the objects can be emphasized. And on the conceptual task, the conceptual attributes of these objects are emphasized. And as we saw in patient DA, when these multidimensional representations that contain both the visual and the conceptual information are damaged, this flexible recombination of information based on task relevance was not possible. And the result is a vulnerability to interference from the task irrelevant dimension. So Chris is planning future work to better understand the mechanisms that drive this representational flexibility. Specifically, we think that we need to arbitrate between two mechanisms. So in the first, the perirhinal cortex might exhibit inhibitory control over its connected regions that represent information in either dimension. So for example, when visual information matters most in the visual task context, it might inhibit interfering conceptual uh, signals from the temporal pole. And when conceptual information is important in the conceptual task, it might inhibit interfering visual signals in LOC. Under this explanation, we might expect that the strength of connectivity between PRC and these regions would shift across task contexts and potentially even be modulated by the degree of similarity between the lure and the target. Now, a second possibility is that the multidimensional representational structure in the perirhinal cortex is modulated through interactions with an independent semantic control network in the inferior frontal gyrus that selects task relevant semantic information. Under this explanation, we might find that connectivity in the perirhinal cortex with the LOC and the temporal pole doesn't change, but instead it's connections between perirhinal cortex and inferior frontal gyrus that reflect the degree of competing interference. But stepping back, it seems taking all of this work together that at the level of perirhinal cortex, it may not be possible to fully disentangle perceptual and conceptual processing. And a better approach is to think about the nature of the representation in which this information is flexibly integrated. These integrated representations in perirhinal cortex provide the informational bedrock to make sense of the cacophony that's present in everyday experience, allowing us to interact appropriately with the objects in our world. So now in the final section of my talk, I'm gonna consider whether we can apply this model for clinical impact. 
We've just started this line of work, which is investigating whether this model extends to other medial temporal lobe regions and whether we can use it to better understand the early stages of Alzheimer's disease. So given that our goal here is to identify the neurocognitive signatures of susceptibility for Alzheimer's disease, it makes sense for us to pivot slightly medially and focus on a structure that's heavily interconnected with the perirhinal cortex, the anterior lateral entorhinal cortex, which henceforth I'm gonna call ALERC. So along with the perirhinal cortex, the ALERC is one of the first regions to show abnormality in preclinical Alzheimer's disease. Um, my group has shown that volumes in the ALERC were related to preclinical cognitive decline in a group of undiagnosed community dwelling older adults, suggesting that a smaller ALERC volume is a marker for Alzheimer's risk years before diagnosis. Looking to anatomy, it has long been thought that there are two parallel information streams through entorhinal cortex that converge on the hippocampus. So one pathway is through the medial entorhinal cortex. This pathway is thought to be largely devoted to spatial and contextual processing. The other pathway leads from perirhinal cortex and projects primarily to the ALERC, which is homologous to LEC in rodents. So this pathway appears to be less spatial, but rather related to representing specific objects or entities. So for example, as discussed earlier, we've shown that the perirhinal cortex is very important for representing the conjunctions of features that comprise complex objects. However, we still don't fully understand the computational properties of the ALERC and the transformations that occur between perirhinal cortex and the ALERC. So looking specifically to ALERC, <clears throat> when you talk about object processing, you can think about it on two levels. So processing the object and the features that compose that object, but also processing how the object relates to the environment. And there's evidence that the lateral entorhinal cortex may contribute to both, depending on whether you're looking at data from humans or from animals. So on the one hand, neuroimaging studies in humans have shown that the ALERC is involved in object memory when recognizing objects from visually similar lores. In contrast, <clears throat> rodent studies suggest that the LEC may be involved in representing the specific spatial properties of objects. So in LEC, we find object trace cells that signal the previous locations of objects. And lesioning LEC leads to deficits in object in place memory or the association between an object and its spatial context. These spatial functions for um, the lateral entorhinal cortex are particularly relevant in light of some really recent exciting data that suggests a revision to this strict parallel streams model. So this new work emphasizes the reciprocal connections that exist throughout the two streams and suggests that we move away from considering them as parallel. So putting all of these literatures together, in two studies, we tested the idea that the human ALERC represents the spatial properties of objects, both within and across objects. In study one, we are looking at the spatial relations between the parts of an object. So this is intra-object configural information. And in study two, we're looking at the spatial relations between an object and its environment or inter-item configural information. This work was led by my graduate student, um, Lachin Young, during his PhD, which he did in my lab. So here, uh, Lachin took a new approach from the methods that I've discussed previously. So he tested the relationship um, of medial temporal lobe brain volumes and related them to eye movement measures of visual exploration. So why are we looking at visual exploration? So visual exploration determines what information is available to be represented in the first place. But unfortunately, it's often not measured empirically. And we think that this might turn out to be very important because the medial temporal lobe seems to be intimately related to viewing behavior. <clears throat> 
So in particular, it's been suggested that the medial temporal lobe provides the signals that guide effective viewing behavior during learning. Specifically, the entorhinal cortex um, has been proposed to be an interface between the ocular motor system and representations that are needed for memory. So viewing behavior, how we move our eyes, may be a particularly sensitive metric of the integrity of medial temporal lobe representations. So in these two studies, Lockin recruited 40 community dwelling participants who did not meet diagnostic criteria for MCI. We administered the MOCA, um, a brief standardized neuropsych test that we know is very sensitive in distinguishing controls from MCI patients. We purposely selected participants that had a range of scores on the MOCA, which we hoped would translate into a range of underlying MTL volumes. We also administered a comprehensive neuropsych battery, which revealed that none of these 40 participants uh, was grossly impaired. So for each participant, Locken followed an established segmentation protocol to manually delineate seven medial temporal lobe regions. Particularly relevant for the work that I'm gonna be talking about today, Locken subdivided the entorhinal cortex into its anterior lateral and posterior medial extents following a recent protocol that had used functional connectivity to split up the entorhinal cortex. So our study was the first time that ALERC volume had been, uh, had been obtained uh, in this way from structural scans. So these volumes were used as predictors in a multiple regression model for each of our behavioral outcome measures. So our first study focused on intra-item configural processing. We used an incidental viewing paradigm in which we recorded eye movements while people viewed configural objects which had a distinct top and bottom half. So we defined three regions of interest on the objects by dividing each object into thirds. We were particularly interested in the middle ROI where the two halves of the object join. We argue that viewing here reflects intra-item configural processing because this region contains the information regarding how the features of an object fit together, whereas eye movements to the periphery reflect more feature-based processing. We also took the total number of fixations to the entire object as a measure of overall novelty detection. Here, more fixations would indicate greater perceived novelty because people tend to like to look more at new things. So we structured our study so that we could explore the effects of stimulus novelty. Participants first viewed three objects, one at a time. This was then repeated six times in what must have been a terribly, terribly boring study for our participants. But then um, on the seventh repetition, we shook things up a bit. So we showed three different object classes that were defined by their novelty. So one item was an exact repeat, one item was a novel recombination of two previously seen features, and one item was completely novel. In terms of eye movements, we found this classic novelty detection um, effect, such that more fixations were directed to these novel and recombined items, and fewer were uh, fixations were directed to the repeated items, which are a bit more boring. So that is, people tended to look more at new things. But what we're really interested in is how this relates to MTL volumes. And here we found that global novelty detection to the whole object was not predicted by volumes in any of the seven MTL regions. So a big uh, null finding here. However, a different picture emerged when we looked at our more focused ROI, viewing to the middle ROI which served as our measure of configural processing because it contains that information about how the features of the object fit together. So here we found that viewing to the middle ROI was predicted only by ALERC volumes. None of the other regions showed a significant relationship. And this was the case for repeated objects, recombined objects, and for novel objects. So regardless of the novelty of an object, volumes, larger volumes of ALERC predicted increased intra-item configural processing. 
So this um, also doesn't simply reflect global cognitive decline because we found that viewing to the middle ROI still predicted ALERC volumes, even after accounting for the effects of age and for MOCA score. The fact that we observe these effects, regardless of whether the objects were new or old, suggests that the signal that's coming from ALERC is more attentional or perceptual rather than memory per se. So in the last study I'm gonna talk about today, we assessed whether these effects would extend to the spatial relations between an object and its environment. So here we created an incidental viewing task in which objects were embedded in scenes. Participants viewed multiple repetitions of many scenes. And then on the fourth repetition, we tweaked these scenes in terms of their novelty. So one scene was an exact uh, repeat. One scene was manipulated such that a critical object, here the guitar, had been moved from its original study location. And one scene was completely novel. So fixations to this critical object ROI were our primary eye movement measure. They provide an, a measure of object in place memory because increased fixations here reflect memory for the spatial location of the object within the environment. And we also have a measure of global novelty detection, which was again calculated based on the overall number of fixations to the whole scene. And again, here, more fixations indicates greater perceived novelty. Again, in terms of eye movements, we found the classic novelty detection uh, effect such that more fixations were directed to the novel and the manipulated scenes and fewer to the repeated on. Uh, items. So that is people looked longer at scenes that had been changed in some way. So they're that, that are novel in some way. So they're showing memory for these scenes. But again, as we observed in the study one for objects, this eye movement measure was not predicted by volumes in our seven MTL regions. However, for the more focused measure of object in place memory, a different picture emerged. So not only did we find that more eye movements were directed to the critical ROI containing the moved object in those manipulated scenes, this also related to both ALERC and parahippocampal volume. So that is to say, larger ALERC volumes predicted increased inter-item processing or better memory for the association of an object with a particular location in that scene. So taken together, these two studies suggest a more general role for the ALERC in representing the spatial properties of objects, both between the parts of an object and also between an object and its environment. As we saw in study one, this isn't necessarily a memory signal because it was not influenced by whether the object was old or whether the object was new. Now that we've established these two measures, future work um, is uh, using expanded samples and longitudinal follow-up to assess whether progression to Alzheimer's disease can be predicted by eye movements and ALERC volumes, as well as by ALERC activity using fMRI. So in conclusion, the work that I've presented today indicates that the same regions that are critical for perceiving a stimulus are also critical for remembering it and for understanding it. And I think that the best way to make sense of these findings is in terms of a representational hierarchy throughout the ventral visual stream that extends into the medial temporal lobe. So simple features and simple feature conjunctions are represented in posterior regions of the ventral visual stream. More anterior regions like perirhinal cortex contain a fully specified representation of the whole object, including its visual and semantic attributes. And in the anterior lateral entorhinal cortex, these object representations become even more complex and have a spatial component, such as how an object relates to its environment. Converging evidence from my lab and other labs around the world has shown, that has shown memory and perceptual functions throughout this processing stream. We found memory in the back of the brain and perception in the uh, front of the brain and vice versa. So I think that it's time to dispense with this notion of a sharp dividing line between perception and memory. And instead of thinking in terms of strict taxonomies,
that are based on a cognitive process with separate, separate segregated systems for memory and perception, I believe that a more productive approach will be to characterize these brain regions in terms of the informational content that's represented throughout this entire hierarchy. So that's all I have to say. Thank you very much for listening. Um, and thanks to my wonderful lab um, who led all this work and to the funding bodies that made it possible. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you.